So thank you for your patience. Today I'm going to complete the series of presentations about the history of the automobile and related technologies by talking about the future. But I'll actually start with a recap of the evolution of the automobile. We talked about before the automobile on Tuesday, and now we're going all the way to the 20, late 2020s and uh, early 2030s. Um, I, of course, I'm going to show you scenes, uh, many more scenes from the love bug because it is the last time we uh, watched that film. But you know, there is also the first written assignment, which is due uh, tomorrow evening. By the end of tomorrow, you're supposed to post on Google Docs your first assignment. You have two options. One is personal reflection about you and the car, if you have any memories, if you can describe any episodes, uh, any examples that would prove either the car still retained their magic or that they've lost their magic. The other, the alternative assignment, you don't have to be to do both. The alternative, if you like films and film analysis, is a short film analysis of uh, a made-for-TV movie that you find on Amazon Prime, which is a very cute uh, film, very well acted, very well shot, great photography. But that, keep in mind, is not a personal reflection. It's a short analysis. You don't need to uh, mention review sources, etc., because you need to focus on the automobile in there, whereas most of the reviews you find out there uh, on it on this on a serpentine road uh, are generic okay if you decide to do the uh, film analysis it's not an exhaustive comprehensive review of the film right so feel free to be selective to just pick a couple of scenes or, or some uh, qualities of the main character right so Keep that in mind. Don't make it too difficult for yourself. I, I mentioned how it works. You have a Google Docs file. Make sure you have one. Otherwise, let me know. I checked on Solar again, and I created Google Docs for the additional students. Make sure that you have editing privileges for that file. And, and quite simply, what I'll do on Saturday morning whenever I wake up and after I have breakfast, I'll open those files and check on your assignments. So it, I'm not going to see whether you posted it at 11.57 fr p.m. Friday night or, or 3 or 5 uh, during the night. As long as I find it in the morning when I check, that's fine. And if I don't, I'll, I'll leave a, a comment uh, to that effect, what happened, uh, etc. Okay, so let me know if you have any questions, but I'd rather respond to those questions after the class because uh, I want to be able to go through this presentation and also finish uh, with the selection of uh, seeds. There is another page that I created this morning and I attached to this, which is a collection of shots, pictures I took at Electrify Expo in Nassau Coliseum on August 13 of uh, this summer. Um, just to give you a sense through images of where we're going, where is the interest by the people, by the regular people, and, and where is the industry going and whether or not they're converging, okay? So. And keep in mind that you find plenty of notes in here so that I don't have to read everything to you now, right? No, no sense in that, I'll just pick on some ideas or summarize the various sections, give you a sense of 
what the sections are trying to communicate. And then later, after you've read this, or if you have already read this and you have questions, you can let me know. Okay, so I initiated the conversation about the future with a recap, which is not simply technical. It gives you a sense of how the industry, automotive industry developed, the directions that were taken at different points in its history, including the part that we will analyze. Because as far as the class readings and some of the films, we will stay within the first period and focus on how this technology, this new technology was perceived and how it was represented, how it entered society and how it was presented as the first technology of modernity, not simply another tool, another instrument of transportation. So 1885 is when you have uh, the uh, very first prototypes of cars, even though we know that it took, for example, Benz's car three years to go out in the roads, on the roads in Germany, thanks to Bertha, the, the wife of Karl Benz. But between 1885 and 1909, that's the experimental phase of the car. Yes, cars are produced, and little by little the numbers increased. However, at least up until 1907, up until the very end of this period, cars were famously unreliable. They were terribly expensive. They were basically for the one percenters, with some exceptions of vehicles. We cannot call them cars. Vehicles with three or four wheels, but wheels that would be similar to what are nowadays bicycle wheels. Um, and made only for short distances, transportation of one or two driver and one or two passengers, but otherwise most cars are terribly expensive, not really accessible, and they don't work very well. But their, their success keeps increasing. So even though they're not working, <coughs> people want them. And it will be only by the end of this period Model T by Henry Ford is 1908. Only at the end of this period, the car is ready for consumption. It's ready for production in larger numbers because of the theories of Ford about assembly lines and the way he implemented them. And also his ideas about prices, right? You know that famously Henry Ford said, I want a car that is that is so affordable, my factory workers can buy it. Okay, and that is a completely different point of view on this technology and the product. Uh, look at how the industry is uh, organized. Not everyone is making full cars. In fact, very few. And, and Ford will change that. So some companies just produce chassis and engines and, and some only produce chassis, some only produce engines. And then there are many who are just body makers and this will keep going until the 1960s and 70s. I've provided some example, Bertone, Pininfarina, Carrozzeria Turin. Notice they're all Italian, there are some in, in France as well and there were some in England but they didn't last long. The, the longer lasting in this kind of business were the Italian body makers. And can you imagine how, not only up until the 60s and 70s, but in some instances into the 1980s, bodies would be produced in Italy and, and then shipped back to the US. Or American automakers would ship the chassis and the engine to Italy and they would put a body on the car and send the complete car back to the United States. Just imagine the complexity of this. And you find that most of these died at some point, went bankrupt, closed shop, and then because there were such famous brands, 
somebody bought the brand, resurrected the brand, and, and therefore you have a, a new date with a fresh start. But Bertone especially used to employ thousands of workers, and then it went down to zero, right? Because the production was centered back in the official factories of Fiat and other makers. So they wouldn't, or Alfa Romeo, they wouldn't simply get the bodies from someone else. And their job by the late 1960s went down to just the production of prototypes. So Fiat, Lamborghini, others would still go to them and say, I need a one model, a unique model, one uh, unit series for the Geneva show or Detroit, etc. make it for me. But you can still see them, right? Uh, I went to Lime Rock and they had what? Uh, I think they had a super leggera uh, made recently, but it was just one. And finally, we should mention some automotive companies are entirely built based on assembling the pieces. So they don't really produce anything. They just purchase the chassis, the engine, etc., and then they put it together. And we should mention the, the most extreme examples, for example, the idea that there are companies doing, for example, carriages so put that, that were pulled by horses and convert to this new kind of technology simply by adding an engine underneath the carriage or behind the cabin of the carriage and they add a steering wheel but most of the body is absolutely identical to what would have been the same model as a carriage pulled by horses. 1910 to 1920s you have an exponential growth in the numbers of automobiles that are circulated in North America, Western Europe and other parts of the world as well. And then from 1914 through 1918 you have World War I and the war starts without much awareness of the potential use of vehicles in the war. So much so, for example, that when the French army is caught by surprise by the German attack in 1914, they organize the sending of reinforcements from the area of Paris to the front line using taxi cabs. They seize about a thousand taxi cabs and they uh, uh, commission their drivers and then they put as many soldiers as they can on each of these cabs and very quickly, in a matter of a few days, they're able to move an entire brigade to the front line. And those taxis then become famous. For example, uh, if you go to the Museo dell'Automobile in Turin, you'll see one of them. And they're known as the taxis of the Marne. Marne being a river where the front line was when they were trying to stop the advancing of the German uh, soldiers. So by the end of World War I, four years later, you have plenty of tracks. Well, we should mention they still have entire battalions moving with what? Not horses, although horses are used and, and there are units based on horses, cavalry units, but by the end of the war, they have entire battalions moving on... Donkey? Huh? Donkey? No. Train? No, yeah. Of course they do. But I'm talking about battalions who are able to move nimbly around the front lines using what kind of vehicle, so to speak, with wheels. Okay. Louder, maybe... Bicycles, anyone? Bicycles? Bicycles was the answer, right? So entire battalions, hundreds of soldiers 
moving out with bicycles. But by the end of the war, they have plenty of trucks, slow moving, but trucks uh, that can carry quite a load. And they have tanks and they have armored vehicles. And then by the end of the war, they put radio stations on those armored vehicles so that they can do reconnaissance missions and communicate immediately as far as they can, as far as the signal can go where the enemy units are. So clearly there is plenty of money going into that. The next stage for me, in my view, is from 1921 through 1959. There are some interesting developments here. 1920s, bye-bye electric cars, bye-bye steam cars. They cease production. They go out of business, one after the other. Were they that bad? Not really. No, not at all. Uh, steam cars suffered from a problem with maintenance. Uh, I don't know if any of you is a fan of the YouTube channel by Jay Leno, and Jay Leno himself is one of the most important collector in that area. He has quite a few steam cars and he's driving them around, but he himself suffered more than a fire, right? Because a steam car has a flame. And a steam car uses the flame to hit water, and hot water will corrode pipes, right? So, not so practical. Also, by the 1920s, you have more modern forms of ignition, right? Not just the crank in front of the car. And a steam car, even an advanced one, will take a few minutes to reach boiling temperature before it can move. After you do that, then you can go and it pulls, has a lot of torque, fine, it goes smoothly. So, out of practicality, steam cars went out of business. Electrical cars were evolving in very interesting ways. For example, um, hybrid cars, whereby uh, there was an engine, but the engine was not moving the wheels. The engine was producing electricity and the electric motor was moving the wheels. Very advanced, right? But it was the rest of the industry that killed the electric car. Mm. We should mention also how range was limited by the 1920s. People didn't want to be confined to 30 to 50 miles, but everything else worked, right? Even at that time, or earlier, even in the 1890s, you would bring your electric car at home and plug it in and charge it. For taxi cabs, and then I'll get your question, for taxi cabs in New York, Already by 1899, they had a very smart system whereby electric taxi cabs would take their customers around and when they were low on charge, they would go to their hub in Manhattan and instead of recharging the cab, they would remove the batteries, put in fresh batteries and the taxi was out and working again. So it worked very well. Um, who had a question? Uh, Max. Would you say electric cars are having somewhat of a revival right now? Yes, and we'll talk about that. But I call it a failed revolution, right? Because the issue is 2022, about 900,000 cars, electric cars, were sold in the United States. Okay, fine, great. Many more than in 2018, I think two or three times as many in four years. However, 900,000 out of how many cars overall were sold in the United States? Any idea? Give me a number, give me a guess. 900,000, a little more than 900,000 are the electric vehicles, but how many vehicles overall were sold that year in the United States? 10 million. More. Are you familiar with these things called numbers? Just say enough, enough higher number. No, less. It, it almost 14 million. So you have 6% of sales assigned to electric cars. Right? Something, something is slightly wrong with that. 
it is not going as planned. I myself, in 2018, uh, bought a house near 347. And of course, I paid less because it's close to 347. But my bold prediction, somewhat naive prediction was, who cares about noise? It's a new house, well insulated, and within five years, so many electric cars will be driving on the roads that we won't hear the noise. Not happening. Stop by a road and wait, count until an electric car comes by, count again until the next electric car come, come by. You'll have to count to 50 or 100, frankly. So it's not happening yet. And yet, we're being told that by, I have a link to a White House press release from April, by 2030, 50% of all cars produced in the United States must be electric. Hmm. I don't know. No, it, it could very well be. However, it won't be 7 million electric cars. That's the issue. So someone will be walking. Some of us will not have a car by then. Otherwise, that number of 50% would, would be a big lie. And I'm afraid that is the case. So World War II comes over, and again, big investments, right? So much so you have a very successful new kind of vehicle called initially Jeep, uh, and then for now, uh, nowadays is SUV that is being introduced, and it becomes a very successful category. Uh, to be Noticed also that by the 1920s, you finally have standards. Up until the 1920s, and you can see that if you go to a museum or a car show, cars have all kinds of levers and pedals. You don't know what they are. So sometimes in order to reverse, you have to press a pedal instead of changing gear with a lever, right? The accelerator can be on the steering wheel, instead of being a pedal. And different companies are doing different things. It is Cadillac first, implementing the modern standard around 1916, and the others will follow by 1930. Okay. And of course, more things you can read about it. 1960 through 1980 is what I call the golden era, especially these 20 years. And in fact, this is the period where you find the most expensive vintage cars. If you find a car that is sold for more than 30, more than 50 million, it's usually from this period, okay? And you can read the rest yourself. Cars are still different, right? So the cars you, you Look at the street and you see different vehicles. And you have no trouble distinguishing one from the other. Whereas these days it can be hard. They tend to be all the same. What is popular now and it's been popular for the past five years or so, grills. And so every car has to have a humongous grill and next year we'll make it larger and, and, so, and so on, right? But cars are not very original. Car racing becomes very popular. Cars in the 1960s are the number one product in the consumption market. So people are spending a lot of money in cars, for cars, right? It's a hot item. 1980s to 2000s, a lot of companies disappear. That had been happening, right? I have an encyclopedia illustrated encyclopedia at home uh, with 4,000 entries. Each entry is a different company. Okay? And of course, 99% of those have disappeared. And at least 50% of them disappeared by 1930. Okay. So there are several mergers. You have these big conglomerates, right? Toyota is buying brands in Japan, and Ford is buying brands in the United States, uh, and also later in England, 
uh, Fiat is buying everything in Italy, but they don't necessarily kill the companies they buy. They, they keep the, the brand, they keep the name, they just make it into uh, a, a, a subcategory of their catalog, right? And I'm uh, trying to provide examples in here. And what's interesting is that by 1980, no one can enter the market. Already it was difficult earlier in the post-war period. Uh, you may have seen the film with Jeff Bridge, uh, right, uh, about um, the Tucker cars. But it's not until Tesla in 2003 that you have a significant new player in this market. At this point, no one can successfully launch a car in big enough numbers, right? You always have small companies, although it was much easier before 1980. Before 1980, if you had a small shop and without fancy tools, with a crew of three people, five people, you could be producing cars, right? There are people who make cars in their garage as a pastime, right? You just need to know, have pipes, metal pipes, you need to know how to bend them correctly, you get an engine outside, right? And then you make the body with aluminum because aluminum can be worked even just with a hammer or better yet if you have a shape made of wood, right? All Ferraris, the most expensive Ferraris from the early 1960s were made by hand. And if you go to the museum in Maranello, the Galleria Ferrari, near the factory, you still see these shapes. So they made the shape of the car in a one-to-one -one scale in wood, and then workers would first eye the general form, right? They would start working without the shape, the wooden shape. And then they were, when they were close, they would try and put it up and then make adjustments. But basically, it was done by hand with aluminum sheets of aluminum. Limited innovation after the 1980s. Yes, there are some additions to the car, but they don't have to because you have these big conglomerates, they're making money and selling cars based on marketing, not technology, right? Especially American cars go to shit, right? They become worse and worse less reliable because the people still buy those models because of the big money that is spent on marketing. Some examples, when the smartphone comes on, well, it's been 20 years and the automotive companies are still struggling. How difficult can it be to connect your phone to the car? Always cumbersome. And even after you manage to connect your phone on the car, provided you have a screen, you don't have a place where to put the phone. I have to buy a car holder. I mean, everyone has two smartphones at least. One that we're using and a spare, or one for their job, one for their personal use. And yet you buy a car and you have to look, where do I put the phone? Oh yeah, here. But then I turn, I have BMW, and there is a place where I can put my phone, but I turn and it goes to the ground, right? It's not a phone holder, it's a space. And forget about charging, sometimes the charger gets out of the glove box, so I have to open the glove box, insert a wire. It, it's crazy how they're ignoring real habits of users. Again, because they don't care. They sell cars anyway. Design, style, accessory are massified, meaning that cars everywhere are the same. Cars within a company are the same, right? You can always recognize an Audi from a BMW, and all Audis and all BMWs are pretty much the same, right? Within a space of five years, they all have the same design for the front, the same design for the back. And it becomes difficult 
try and distinguish a Q3 from a Q5, an X3 from an X2, it's almost impossible. They care about recognition of the brand. You know it's a BMW. They don't care about the uniqueness of the model. Of course, in the, inside the factory is a lot of bots replacing actual workers, right? The bots are painting the cars. The bots are assembling parts of the car. The bots are welding the body together. So what happens? 2000 through 2022, the most recent statistics we have, look, there is some growth. Of course, there are peaks, the 2008 crash, the house bubble, but again, from 2018, even before COVID, things go down. And this growth is not US, it's not Italy, it's not France or Germany. This growth, these segments of growth here are India and China, developing countries, because the industry in traditional markets is stagnant, right? And you may have seen pictures of big lots with abandoned cars that will never be sold and eventually will be scrapped. And you can get more statistics if you, if you click, okay? And this is an example of conglomerates who have retained different brands because they need to differentiate between categories. So if you take Fiat, Fiat is the average car for the average man. Then they have Lancia, and essentially even Lancia is now a Fiat. Lancia used to be its own company with very te technologically very advanced. Um, but now Lancia is simply Small cars and not too expensive, but more refined, slightly more luxury vehicles than Fiat, Alfa Romeo are sportier, Ferrari are the sportiest, and Maserati are in between Alfa Romeo and Ferrari in terms of speed, performance, and price. So they're all produced the same. So for Alfa Romeo, they made the Giorgio platform. They called it Giorgio in 2015. And on that platform, like a chassis with suspensions and wheels, etc., they made Alfa Romeos, like such as the Stelvio, the Giulia, they made Maseratis, right? And they're still using it. So it's all about marketing. It's all a marketing ploy. So what's the difference between a Toyota and a Lexus? It's just that Lexus is supposed to be the luxury brand, but it's the same company, same approach. And they tried the Scion, which is now defunct, for youth, for the young buyers. It was interesting. Scions were interesting. Okay? Hyundai is doing the same with Genesis as the luxury brand. And in the case of Hyundai, it's not even like they bought Genesis. They created Genesis as a fake brand to imitate what the others were doing with companies they merged with. Okay? And I like this, Econo students of economics may uh, not approve. Uh, uh, I had one student disapprove it, and I get it, but I strongly believe this, that cars of today are enticing enough that you can buy it, buy them, but they're also clearly disappointing enough that after a while you say, Oh, if only I had an X5. And after you have an X5 by BMW, you say, oh, but, but there are things that are not, I should buy an X7. So, simple things that could be installed even on a base model are strategically omitted so that on the basic model, the ride has to be somewhat rough. It's not about money, because in fact, the best thing you could do is buy a cheap car, even a used car, buy a Honda for $10,000 and change the suspensions. $1,000 plus work, or you do the work yourself, and you buy top suspensions and the ride is incredible, right? And you spend a fifth than a BMW Class 3. 
They don't do it for a reason. They are so cheap that even things such as spark plugs on the basic models are trash. And what are they saving? Maybe 50 cents per spark plug? A dollar per spark, spark plug? Nothing. But it's part of the fact that, yes, well, it drives, okay. But you have, in the process, you have also to realize that you want more. And if they gave you a basic car that rides well, with good suspensions, that is reliable, etc., you'd be satisfied for life, right? You wouldn't go and spend more. That's why they have to cheat you systematically. Okay, packaging, of course, is one market employee. I want to add, I don't know, an ashtray or a spare wheel or the sunroof. Well, that's part of a package for $3,000 that gives me things I don't need. But there is no way to customize the car and, and say, I just want a sunroof. I just want a spare wheel and sensors. Yes? Honestly, I think, unfortunately, that's an issue not just for cars, but also um, technology as a whole. I'm sure any PC user can tell you just how expensive a lot of things are due to the growing and due to the growth of both inflation and monopolies, I feel like this sort of issue is going to worsen over time. Yeah. And perhaps it even collapses in on itself, this tech empire or this automobile empire. Absolutely. No, no, they're, they're trying to extract uh, every last penny you have in your pocket. Uh, and, and the PC industry would be a, a, another kind of interesting um, discussion, right? Although, in the case of the PC industry, you can still go drive to Westbury to Micro Center, get the, the, the pieces and put together a desktop or a laptop, right? I, I, I've been building my own desktop for 15 years now and I save perhaps a thousand dollars a piece. Laptops are a bit more complicated but not impossible. Cars used to be like that 1960s and 70s, so many Americans fixed their cars, changed their calipers. When I came to Stony Brook in 1994, I could still find students. I remember a female student who was able to change calipers. I, I don't mean to be, it came out horrible, even a female <laughs> student. Oh my God, please fire me. Uh, and, uh, but meaning, Someone, age 18, age 20, who had learned from a friend or a member of the family, could do operations, not just change the spark plugs, but work on their engines, work on their cars, and save a bundle and be able to afford a vehicle. And where are those people now? Are they, they are the exception, right? No, oh, yeah, I, okay. I'm, I'm the exception. Good, good. What kind of operations and services can you provide for your car? Well, I know how to change uh, the spark plugs. I know how to work the engine. The, uh, I have, I also change have the oil, for yes, example, right? Oil, change yes. your own oil. Yeah. You, you save so much, right? You can get the oil from Amazon. Yeah, the good oil. oil. It also helps with my friend. He's also an engineer. So he basically just taught me all kinds of scratch. Mm -hmm. And he actually said, if you ever need help or something yeah. that's very difficult, just call me off this for you. So I just didn't want to go through the words. And, and talking about oil, are you aware that the U.S. is the only place where they tell you to change oil every 3,000 miles? And everywhere else, from Asia to Europe, people go on for eight, nine, ten thousand 10,000 miles without changing the oil. There is no need to change the oil of 3,000 miles other than to replenish the pockets of uh, the shops. And also because basically they sell you crap oil that doesn't last more than 3,000 miles. But it's the labor that costs. Yes? Um, is there any way to get access to this uh, oil? And if not, would you get away with not changing your oil frequently during, say, yearly inspections? What do you mean? have access to oil. Purchase oil? Well, yeah, you yeah, can... like the higher quality oil. But yes, yes, of course, absolutely. Uh, you, you go to these places, I guess, like oh, Auto well. Trader, <laughs> etc. I, I, I bought, before I had, now I have an electric car. 
so I don't need to change the oil. But before, I, I would buy high quality synthetic oil uh, for my turbocharged Fiat 500 from Amazon. And, and then I didn't change it myself, though. but simply because I don't like getting messy. So I took it to a shop. Okay, so this is what I was mentioning before 2022, 918,000 electric vehicles sold out of almost 14 million. Not so many. And of course, there was the AI self driving revolution, and now you don't hear much about it. Right? And I've provided some links to uh, investigations, accidents that caused investigations. And yes, mostly in California, you have uh, self driving cars. Uh, but you must have heard, for example, about or, or seen short videos about people who simply place an orange cone on the top of a self-driving vehicle, and the self-driving vehicle stops. They, they see, they become like the non-playing character in a, in a video game, not really advancing medicine. Um, is it true that with Tesla, if you're, say, late on a monthly payment, they outright lock you out of your vehicle? Yes, they do. It could be. I'm sure they can do that. And just recently they discovered there is a Elon Musk mode that can be activated on a Tesla. What does that mean? I don't know. Your, your, your car loses some social skills and... I don't know what, what it is. Because I, I didn't read. I wasn't very interested. Maybe it's some super ludicrous mode. I don't know. On the positive side, we can imagine a day if this technology becomes, works, first of all, and becomes safe enough because hacking would be a big deal. If that happened, we can imagine, and architects, urban planners have imagined a better urban environment where since you have sensors on the cars, you narrow the lanes, right? Because the sensors have a different kind of tolerance, so you can have uh, cars driving within two inches, five inches from the, the end of the lane and not deviate. Narrower lanes means wider sidewalks, and then on the sidewalks you have enough room or in between lanes for green um, in, in cities. So, that could be a better New York, but who knows. But what's the big thing to keep in mind? The success of Uber, right? And, and that is more likely going to be our future, some kind of car sharing. You don't own a car, but you call one without a driver on your phone. It comes, self-drives itself, and takes you to your destination while you're working or sleeping or watching the screen of your phone or tablet. 1920s and 30s, I included some considerations about COVID, etc., but I'm going to skip that. And I included pictures from last year, last year's Electrify Expo, which is supposed to be a showcase for the electrical future of automobiles. But what you notice is that you have luxury cars, right? You have cars that are big, expensive, they're uh, performing very well, right? In terms of speed and acceleration to the cost of range. So what is the green revolution in this case really about? It's just more of the same, meaning I have electricity so I can continue to sell people a car that accelerates very fast, very quickly, and that is very big. Right, because that's what the industry wants, or what is assumed to be the perfect product for the general public. This is a wonderful Kia, the EV6, I think. Yeah, uh, but again, we're talking about a sixty thousand dollar car, right? Uh, 
and an even this is a prototype for the K9 uh, the, for the EV9, and this year the EV9 uh, uh, could be seen in Electrify Expo. Again, it's a huge car. This is 5,500 pounds of electric car with less than 300 miles as a range when it should have been should have been smaller, lighter, and with a range of up to 500 miles, right? Do we need this? Well, people still want that. When they, want to, when they buy a car, they want it big and fast. That's it. And that's what you find. Even if you're looking for something else, good luck. This is 110,000 BMW, electrical BMW, right? And this, this kind of article makes me smile. All electric car and truck sales by 2035 would save 2.7 trillion. Save how? Because supposedly you don't use gasoline and electricity is cheaper. But if this number would be true by 2035, who would be missing money? You would be saving money, but who wouldn't be without a chunk of your money? And when you realize that, you know that the Green Revolution is not about saving money using electricity. Who would be losing if this came to reality? Gas companies. Pardon me? Gas companies. Not, not, not really. Not really. Because the gas companies would produce gas to power electrical plants, right? Power stations to use electricity because otherwise, how can you? So it's either coal or gasoline. Don't care. It's the government, right? Whenever you put a gallon of gas, a lot of money goes into the coffers of the American government. So do you really think that the American government will give up on hundreds of, bi of billions or even trillions of dollars of gas tax money? Of course not. And in fact, most probably, Gasoline taxes will be replaced by mileage fees, whereby an app on your car or your phone will tell the authorities that you drove 600 miles this month. And therefore, you have to pay, let's say, 15, 15 cents per mile, $90 in taxes. Right? So the Green Revolution is not about saving money. Don't buy an electrical car hoping that you'll save money. It's not happening for a variety of reasons, right? Teslas are made of aluminum, so a fender bender will cost you $9,000. You find plenty of examples on Reddit. But even later, things will adjust, and you'll spend pretty much the same amount of money. And so some people check in their cars, electrical cars, at NASA Coliseum last year. But both last year and this year, most people were here. Most people were trying electrical bicycles, bicycles with electrical engines, and they were trying other forms of transportation. Right? That was the interest. Electrical scooter with limited range for small urban areas. Scooters of different kinds. This might have been the future, right? Micro cars, electrical micro cars, very cheap. But you just see prototypes after prototype, but they're not taking off, right? Every time, this is last year, last year's auto show, you see these prototypes, but you don't see them in the street. They used to be popular, right? Micro cars existed in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, but they're not popular anymore. They're trying. This is the Citroën Ami, Ami friend, which is now made also by Fiat under the name of Topolino. This is supposed to be around five, six thousand dollars, made of plastic, very simple, cheap to operate, a range of 50 miles or so, which should be sufficient in a metropolitan area. They're not really selling that many. We'll, we'll see if this takes off. This is a small Renault, and you can click and watch the video, but it's not working, 
really. Okay, so the future looks a lot like the past in terms of social distribution. Based on what I see now, my prediction is that the wealthy, the affluent part of society will be able to afford these big, quick electrical vehicles. Average people, especially in urban areas, will either priced, be priced out of an electrical vehicle or could, will not be able to have it out of practicality, right? If you don't have access to a garage with a charger, then you cannot have an electrical car in New York City. However, like 120 years ago, people will be able to rent a car or share a car instead of owning one. Revel is a good example for New York City. I don't know if anyone has tried the Vespa by Revel, kind of a Vespa a scooter, but they also have Teslas. Okay, and like, very much like 120 years ago, what is right now the, the, the most lively part, the most dynamic part of the industry? Super exotic. Not even exotic cars. Super exotic cars. From $1 million app with large margins of profit, right? Because uh, according to numbers that circulated around 2020, it took forth 908 sold cars to make as much as a single Ferrari, right? So a single Ferrari could be $100,000, whereas a Ford Focus might make $300 for the, the Ford company. But look at these examples. You have all these categories now. Retro mode and resto mode are taking cars from the past and modifying them with uh, new parts. And then you have continuation cars, which is factories making the same car they used to make in the 1960s. For example, here, you can buy an Aston Martin DB5, the same you see in No Time to Die, for a bunch of millions. And it's not a replica, because it's the same factory using the same blueprint from the 1960s and doing these cars. But you, see, you find here example after example. This, for example, is a Bugatti. There are examples of Lamborghini in here. I was looking for something I added this morning, but it's not, it did not went live in here. Just recently in August, Alfa Romeo introduced the Alfa Romeo 33, which is the retro uh, uh, designed uh, sister of a car from 1967. And it's going to cost from 2 million app, produced only in 33 units, or however many they can sell after they sold the first. The first 33 are already sold. Last year, before the car existed, could be shown, they sold uh, in September, in about two weeks, they sold 33 of them. 